signing off. Okay. Exciting. Hi everyone, thanks for logging on. We're gonna get started in just one minute. Thanks for signing on everyone. We're gonna get started in just one minute. Nice to see some names we know. Veronica from Empowerment Plan is here. Exciting. Um, okay. I committed to starting us on time, so I'm going to kick things off. Um, I know people will continue to join, um, but we'll, we'll get going. So a very warm hello to everyone who has joined us. We are so glad that you're here. My name is Kelly Cobb. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the VP of Giving at Bombas. I'm so excited to be able to host this discussion around empowerment, racial equality, and homelessness tonight. There's certainly a lot of complexity in these topics and an hour hardly feels like enough. It's never quite enough, but this certainly won't be the last time that we're discussing these topics. We're committed to continuing to have conversations like these and inviting all of you, our team, our customers, and community to be a part of it. This is still fairly new to Bombas. This is our third in our ongoing speaker series. We'll continue to host one every month, digging into the many topics that intersect with homelessness. So we hope you'll keep coming back to learn with us. Let's get into tonight's topic. February, as I'm sure you all know, is Black History Month. Black History Month celebrates Black excellence, history, and history in the making. It also recognizes widespread injustice, inequality, and systems rooted in racism. As it directly relates to Bombus's mission of helping individuals who are at risk of or experiencing homelessness, we recognize that Black individuals make up 40% of the homeless population compared with 13% of the general population. The deep-rooted inequality wrapped up in that statistic alone is all too great, and it points to the massive amount of work that needs to be done. Tonight, we're going to talk about the importance of this focus, about the work that has been done and is being done with three women who, with the organizations they're speaking on behalf of, are making their mark. More history in the making. I'm so pleased to introduce Empowerment Plan, who is what is, which is, excuse me, a Michigan, Detroit, Michigan based organization. It was founded in 2012. And it was founded to, it was founded with the mission to end the cycle of generational homelessness and poverty through employment. Joining us tonight is Koi Mosley, who's the Director of Human Resources at Empowerment Plan. Koi is a mother, a mentor, a mentee, and an advocate. She's fueled by her passion to make a difference and help others. Active in her community, she's known for her generosity and leadership. She has 20 years of experience in human resources and has earned several degrees and certifications in management, strategic management, and nonprofit management. Her experience includes 13 years in the nonprofit space and five years in local government. At Empowerment Plan, Koi believes she is now in a role that marries her passion and expertise. That's the ultimate pairing, absolutely. Also from Empowerment Plan is Librita Dobine, a seamstress there. Librita, affectionately known as Brie, is the single mother of five beautiful children, two girls and three boys. She enjoys spending time with her family and friends and being of help to those in need. Brie is an advocate for self-care and also loves spending time alone. 
I can relate to that. Bree is currently pursuing her GED while being employed full-time at Empowerment Plan. In 2017, Bree found herself in a domestic violence relationship. Luckily, she was strong enough to escape. Leaving that relationship also required Brie to leave her home and belongings she shared with her abuser. Brie was homeless yet determined. She located a shelter for herself and her then three children. And while at the shelter, she was introduced to Empowerment Plan. As they say, the rest is history. She's currently in her fourth year of employment with Empowerment Plan and serves on the event planning committee. She sees herself as a motivator to her peers. She's a walking testimony and loves sharing her story to encourage others. And third, from Cheney University of Pennsylvania, the first historically black college and university, which has a long history of excellence, is Rosalind Henderson, who is program director there. Rosalind is a native of Southern Chester County of Pennsylvania and has 20 years experience working in higher education. She holds a number of impressive degrees and is currently a PhD candidate at Walden University. Also impressive, Rosalind holds a number of certifications including mental health first aid, autism 101, anger management, and TRIO trainings. TRIO is something that I just learned about. It's a federal outreach and student services program that's designed to provide services for folks from under-resourced backgrounds. As program director at Cheney University, she provides support to students that are first generation, low income, homeless, in foster care, and or have a documented disability. As a result of her work, she founded the Sea Wolves Food Pantry in 2019 to help fight food insecurity and period poverty on campus. Rosalind is committed to assisting and motivating young people to attain education because educational achievement can never be taken from an individual. Love that. Uh, okay, enough from me. I would love to hear from you all now. So let's start. I'd love the audience to get to know you all a little bit more beyond my introductions. Um, so much of where we're at now is thanks to our journey. So I'd love for each of you to tell us a little bit about what got you to where you are now. Let's start with Koi and then Bree and Roslyn. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me, Kelly and Sam. I know you're still on here. Um, well, you kind of covered it, but I will say one interesting thing is <laughs> when I decided to go to college, I originally went for accounting. And um, what changed my major is like, I couldn't sit at the desk and do the same thing every day, day in and day out. And so I, I, um, I had a job as an HR assistant with this huge company and the HR manager was so cool. Like we were friends and I said, she said, you should think about HR. And I said, you know what? I love people and like HR is something that's always changing. It's always evolving. And it's never like the same day, in, in day by day. So I decided to change my major and I started off after I left that company, I, I went to nonprofit, stayed there, as you said, I'm on my bio for a number of years, um, learned so much um, being a one person, well, then it was a two person HR department, um, left there to go to local government and return to my passion, which is nonprofit. And I'm so happy to be where I am now with like-minded people who just want to help one another as well as the community. That's about it. Thank you. Like you said, Marin, expertise and passion. That sounds like you've really landed at the right place. Bree, I'd love to hear about what got you to where you are now. Hello, I'm Labrita. Um, so I always have been determined and I have had some barriers in life. I was young and just really not thinking. And I always knew better. So once I was introduced with to the empowerment plan, it's just like God answered my prayers. Like it showed me so much about being a woman a young single mother and just being determined I the empowerment plan has helped me with getting my license 
learning how to drive. And that was the biggest goal for me. I was accomplishing so many of my goals and it just put me in a happy spot. Then from what I was years ago. So I just felt like the bumpy road has, it's turned smooth now. I'm, I'm really a changed woman now. I came into this program as a young girl, a young woman. And now I feel like I can probably say I'm a grown woman. Incredible. Thank you, Bree. Rosalind, let's hear from you. Before I say what I need to say about myself, I want to say hats off to you, Bree. Thank you. Hats off to you. Just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful accomplishments. And for you to be able to really tell the world your story is a phenomenal thing. So hats off to you and congratulations and everything that you've done and everything that you will do in the future. You. You're welcome. So as my bio says, I'm Rosalind Henderson, grew up in Southern Chester County, Pennsylvania, small town close to Lincoln University of Pennsylvania, which is HBCU. It's a friendly rivalry of Cheney University because we always say we are the battle of the first. Cheney University was founded in 1837. Lincoln was founded in 1854. So we always say we're a rivalry because we are the first at Cheney. However, Lincoln University is the first that actually conferred actual degrees to individuals of African descent. For me, I never imagined I would be in higher education, to be honest. When I was growing up, I loved going to school. I loved learning, but I loved art. I went to art school. And along the path and the journey, which I'm never, no one's ever really in charge of, I actually landed at Lincoln University, the same university that I would walk on as a child and, and go to computer labs and learning labs. And they called me and I said, sure, I'll work in fiscal affairs. When I really got to work with the students and interact with them, I said, you know what, this is where I want to be because we always have to teach the younger generation because as we get older, we will now pass the baton to them to lead and serve as we do. So that's how I fell into higher education and I've been here ever since. Incredible. Thank you all for sharing these pieces of your journey that have brought you here. And one of the themes that I'm hearing and a big theme for the conversation tonight is empowerment. The empowered choices that you're all able to make to get to where you are now. Um, sometimes we talk about empowerment as there's the saying, uh, giving a hand up and not a handout. And I disagree with that statement. I'd say, if I can continue with this reference, that they very often go hand in hand and aren't mutually exclusive, a handout and a hand up. For example, if I'm relating it to some of the work that I get to do, the ability to offer someone a pair of socks, a material need that needs to be replaced every so often can lead to building a relationship with a person or organization that's giving out those socks or whatever it might be, which then leads to an empowerment to seek services or, or take that next step. And I, I think that there's often a lot of power in being able to provide that sort of interim support or comfort along the way to giving someone a hand up. So I'd love for each of you to weigh in on, on what that phrase means to you. Um, if you agree or disagree, let's talk it out. So Rosalind, let, let's start with you. Will you tell us how that phrase resonates and what the, those ideas mean to you in the work that you do? For me, I've always had the perception that no one wants a handout. However, when you give a hand up, that's a genuine act of kindness and concern for that individual. So when I'm assisting someone, I never 
think of it as a handout because to me that's offensive to that person because you never know how and why that person is in the situation they're in at that time. And we have to be very mindful of that because folks don't wake up one day and say, I want to be in an abusive relationship or I want to be homeless or I want to be food insecure. Things just happen that way. So folks have to really be mindful. And when when we're doing a hand up, we're helping those folks get through that situation and not giving them a hand out. Because to me, a hand out is offensive and it's not helping that person to get out of that current situation. So yes, they are parallel and they can run hand in hand. But again, for those who are really genuinely helping and giving, we are going to give you a hand up. So therefore you can in turn return that hand up to someone else that will not only help the individual, it's gonna help their family, the community, and then it's gonna help globally. And that's the way I feel when I think about a hand up and a hand out. Fantastic. I mean, truly empowered thinking. Bree, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So Ms. Rosland pretty much summed it up. I mean, like, oh my goodness, like everything I, I really agree with exactly what she said. Um, I do understand where you could be going with it, but being in a certain situation, I I know how it feels to to be to for somebody to feel like they're doing something for you. So side note with that being said, that motivates me every day to do everything by myself. You know, if if it's meant to be that somebody helped me, I'ma take it and you know, but it's not never overdoing anything that someone's giving me but it is it's it's a win-win with that that phrase and I feel like it's you have to work for the hand up and it's going to give you that prop that hand out it's just going to keep you in the same situation every time because you think you can keep going to that hand out because it was so easy to get the first time but in the way of life that's not how we go Absolutely right. With that hope that with with an initial hand out that it's it's leading to that empowerment for the hand up and that that decision to be able to to answer to that, um, which you've done incredibly, which is really amazing. Uh, Koi, what are you thinking? Um, I'm along the same lines of, as both Rosalind and Brie, um, it, it goes along with this saying, like, if you give a person a fish, they'll eat for a day. But if you teach them how to fish, they can eat for a lifetime. Um, and so I think that's what we're talking about here. And, and as Rosalind said, we have to be mindful that we're not offensive to those that we're helping. And I think from my experience, I think when you're helping folks, they can tell if you're truly authentic or not. And when you're truly giving a hand up, I believe they can feel it. Um, and as well as they can feel the handouts, like, like Bree said. Um, but w like she said, I totally understand where you're coming from. You, we have to give out socks because that's a tangible thing that folks need. Just like we give out coats. We know people need coats. So we have to give them coats, but in giving them coats, like you said, we're hoping that we're giving them some sort of hope, letting them know that we care and so forth. So I think we're all on the same page. <laughs> and it seems like Empowerment Plan is doing such, such a beautiful job of doing that. And just thinking about a job in itself and for someone who's experienced homelessness or ongoing lived trauma, we understand that in order to feel empowered and to take those next steps towards self-sufficiency, one doesn't just need a job. There is a need for stability and support services that can help address those traumas before successful job commitment is possible. Labrita and Koi, how does the empowerment plan address those needs? And, and I know they do it very well, but for our audience and, and thinking about your 60-40 programming approach, I'd love for you to explain that a little bit. And also knowing that in your program, not one single employee has fallen back into homelessness, which 
I mean, truly incredible. Um, so I'd love to hear from you on that. Rosalind, we'll, we'll talk about the same topic as it relates to education, um, but Labrida and Koi, Koi, do you wanna, you wanna continue talking to us about the 6040 plan and, and how it really works? Sure. Um, so as you mentioned, we have a 6040 model where, uh, for those that don't know, empowerment plan hires individuals, well, parents experiencing homelessness from shelters or housing programs. Um, and when we hire, we look at the total person, like what are their barriers? How can we help? Or how can we help them achieve their goals? Um, and so the first thing that most folks need is immediate income after being, well, after experiencing homelessness, you know, you've lost income for such a long time or whatever amount of time. Um, so we meet that in immediate need of full-time income but as you said, we need to pair it with other things. What is it um, or what does this individual want to accomplish to get themselves and their families back on track? Is it GED? Is it mindfulness and meditation? Is it financial wellness? Um, so we offer the 40% of paid time for them to work on their individual goals. Um, that because That's because most of the time after you go to work from nine to five and you have children at home, you have to get dinner. You're not, you're not gonna wanna go to school. You're not gonna wanna leave back out. You're not gonna wanna talk to anyone about finances. I mean, you got kids to look after, you have to do dinner, you have to get ready for work the next day. And so we found that if we include everything at work, it's easier for the person or the individual to get it done during work time. And that's what we have to do in order if we're looking at the total person. So Brie, Brie can probably expound on her experience. That's the policy part of it, but Brie's actually lived it and participated in it. So you wanna talk about it, Brie? Sure. So, the 6040 program is like heaven sent. Like I would never imagine doing everything at work, like half the things that I do. So I've been with the empowerment plan for almost four years and they put me through driver's training. They helped me get my license. I love me time. And with five kids, I never can get peace and quiet. I'm, I'm surprised that it's going on right now, to be very, very honest. But to just know that my job is dedicated to giving me an hour or a day, you know, to, to get my mental together, you know, they really care and show me that it's not about getting a product out. It is, but they care about the person itself. And that just, it tells a lot, it means a lot. Like I'm very grateful for this. I, I wouldn't expect this anywhere else. Like this is amazing. And I'm grateful to be a part of it. I think that that people first mentality is, is so incredibly important. I feel lucky to say that I, I think it does exist elsewhere. At least I know it does at Bombas, which definitely helps us do the work that we do. And it is so nice to hear that it exists at Empowerment Plan. And I have a feeling that in Rosalind's work, it must exist as well. So Rosalind, if we're thinking about commitment to education specifically, and I, I know that's a component of Empowerment Plan as well, but Rosalind, how does the work that you do support your students? And um, Koi mentioned this, this holistic thinking. Why is it so important to think holistically about the support that you're offering? In regards to the holistic approach, as Koi stated, and as Bree has actually demonstrated, when you're helping someone, you have to really touch on the spirituality, the intellectual piece of it, the physical and the emotional piece 
because folks come and a lot of times they're broken in various areas. So when you have that holistic approach, you're not only working in, for my example, the academic or the intellectual piece, we're looking at those other three components because we wanna make sure that when that person steps out that door with a degree, that they are 100% ready to tackle the world. So we always really stress the holistic approach because to repeat myself, a lot of times we have students who come from marginalized backgrounds and they have a lot of trauma that they haven't dealt with or they're dealing with. So yes, we have the academic portion where we provide tutoring 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Also in the office, we also do success plans to say, what are your goals? What do you want to accomplish? Why you are, excuse me, why you are here. But we also have to give them the financial literacy, like the empowerment plan, because we need to understand that folks need to be educated. I'm first generation college student. I was. So my parents, while I was teaching or learning about student loans, loans and finances and things of that nature, I was actually helping my parents learn as well. They knew the basics and it wasn't any fault of their own. It's just the way they were taught. So in order to really level the playing field for folks, we have to go in and hit on all those components. Back to the financial literacy piece, we have to because our children, and even Bree, Bree's a single mom with five children who is now learning financial literacy. So she's gonna be able to level that playing field for not only herself and her children. That will constitute into what is gentle, generational wealth. So we teach our students about getting scholarships, maintaining that GPA. If you get student loans, these will be the consequences. If you get a student loan and you have a quote unquote refund, you have to pay this money back. This can stop you from buying a home, getting good interest rates and even employment because it will affect your credit rating and things of that nature. So we do things where we know we're gonna teach them intellectually, but we're gonna give them financial literacy because that is also a mandate of TRIO Student Support Services by the government. But we're also gonna hit on the life coach and a life piece because again, you are emotionally, some folks need to really understand why am I so emotional about certain issues? And we bring them in with our life coaches and we talk to them and we let them know that you are loved and whatever circumstance that you are going in right now, it has actually helped shape you to be who the person that you are, but it's not going to define you. And with education, that's going to be your hand up because that's going to propel you out of that circumstances that you are currently in. So that's our approach day in and day out. I think I eat, sleep and breathe that type of approach because going back to what I said, I'm getting older, I'm a grandmother. So I want to pass the baton to not only my children, but my children's children and so on and so on. And I also wanna do that to the students so they can understand that once you leave, the sky's the limit. Gosh, Rosalind, that we need more of you. And I'm, it makes me so hopeful to know that you're passing this thinking on to your students and knowing that they'll feel empowered to continue to share it. I mean, there's there's so much of that life coaching, I think that's missing in, in so many of our educations and upbringings. And it's a really good segue into this next question that I'm thinking about, which is around mentorship and the idea that not all of us grow up in a situation where we have mentors or, or that type of support, people we can look up to. And even as we move throughout different phases of our lives, the way that that need for mentorship changes and we may find ourselves without someone that we can relate to or that inspires us there, you know, that we can really see ourselves in. And whether it's overt or a perception that we absorb over time, it seems that we're more often told all of the reasons why we can't do something rather than why or how we can. 
And so continuing with this idea of empowerment, why is it so important to be able to see ourselves in the people who can empower us, our mentors? And how can we do a better job in ensuring that those mentors feel equally accessible? Bree, I'd love to start with you. Oh, you're on mute, Bree. So as a kid, I was introduced to the Big Brother, Big Sister program. So I really was hands-on with the mentor. And I it was it was a really good thing. Like I was transitioning from a a girl to a young woman at the time. So and the obstacles that I went through with my mentor, she was really there for me. She was concerned. She always checked on me daily. Like, I didn't know a stranger could be so passionate about being a good example to a little girl. She didn't know me. She didn't owe me anything. And I needed it. And I guess she sensed it. And... I was going through my first pregnancy then and I was so afraid to tell her and she was really disappointed in me because I didn't have no reason to be afraid to talk to my mentor. I was supposed to be able to communicate with her and be open and you know she's supposed to make me feel comfortable. We you know so it was something that I had learned and I embraced it. I, I really, I regretted it, and but I also embraced it because she meant a lot to me just to know that she was concerned about me and she didn't have to be. So it, it rubbed off on me turning into the young woman that I was transitioning into. So now my demeanor everywhere I go, I make sure I try to give insp inspirational words to everybody, some good advice, you know, and I really be concerned about everything, you know, and I try to see the next time I see the person, if, you know, they was going through something and I see where they headed. And that, that shows me if, if it was on, on, on the right path going where, where I was coming from, just to see if a listening ear were really turn into good motivation so mentors are very important and I don't to be honest I don't think it's a way for them to even feel equal like maybe maybe I, I take that back I take that back if I feel like sometimes I can be a mentor to some and if I was I, I would like to see in a person the change, you know, like progress and better things going for themselves. So I feel like, and I would say to see progress, if I was a mentor, to feel equal to my mentee, I, I, will, I would love to see progress. Thanks, Bree. And I'm sure you've been an incredible mentor to, to your children and to those that you work with at Empowerment Plan and beyond. I know Koi is nodding her head at that. And Koi, uh, why, why is the model of Empowerment Plan so powerful? Um, I, I think Bree just kind of showed us why it's so powerful. Um, I mean, we get to work with 32 other ladies, just like Brie, but different in the same token. Um, and one, of, one of the things that I think is what we call an empowerment plan, our secret sauce, is <laughs> that we have, a, we have a team who genuinely cares and a team who, who um, is not just in it for a job, you know? Um, because the, the folks that you serve can tell the difference. Um, and we often say the, the individuals that we serve, but although we're helping them meet their goals, I think they, they, 
often help us as well. Um, so I think a part of the question was, um, how do how do we see ourselves and others? It's knowing that we, any one of us, can be one or two or three pay paychecks away from homelessness, right? And then just because a person is experiencing homelessness doesn't mean they, you know, don't have a degree. We have several ladies on our team with, with degrees, with, you know, we have one who has a degree in like bio something, like some crazy <laughs> scientific term. And um, so I think it's important that we see ourselves in each other. And what would you do for yourself if you were in this situation? You know what I mean? Or someone that you loved was in this situation um, and not think that we know it all because we're, we're, we never know enough that we can't learn. But in the same token, we can always teach what we know. Uh, Corey, that is just it's such an important reminder. I, you know, to when we're thinking about, yes, we might not all have had the same experiences, but to see through to that human quality and recognize that any one of us could be in a, in a situation that could be universally felt, like you said, a few paychecks away from homelessness, experiences of lived trauma. And to be able to, to recognize that in another person truly does feel like the foundation to being able to reach out and, and help. And I think like Bree said, you know, you're, we're thinking about this mentor that you had that didn't owe you anything or, you know, that was there for you every day. And I, I think that's the beauty in that kind of relationship is that, you know, she saw, she saw herself in you too and, and the way that she could, she could be there, like she would be there for herself. And I, I think that's, such a nice reminder, Koi, thank you. Rosalind, I'd, I'd love for you to weigh in on this too, if, you, if you'd like to add. Oh my goodness, both Koi and Bree hit it right on the nose when it comes to mentoring and for you to actually look at yourself and say to yourself, I could be this person in this situation and I just would like someone to help me if that's the case. And when we look at ourselves as, as mentors, I always say that I tell folks, don't be like me, be better. Be better. Because we as mentors, as Chloe was saying, we're sharing the information. We were giving them the knowledge to empower them to become better folks and individuals and communities. I've had my share of mentors in the form of family members. I was blessed enough that my great aunties and uncles and grandparents and aunts and uncles, we really had a tight knit family where everyone came together and showed love to one another, regardless if you saw them today or last year, they would take you by the hand and sit down with you and just give them or give us the information that they knew about life and about circumstances. But moreover, they taught us to love everyone, regardless of social, economic conditions, gender, religion, color. So as a child, it was instilled in us to have that love and don't have sympathy for folks, but have empathy. So as I became older and I was around folks that were scholars and educators and doing quite well in the African-American community, then those folks were described as mentors to us. I just thought they were regular folks that were showing us love and giving us that knowledge. And it's just, it shapes you as a mentor and a mentee. Like Bree says, her mentor has shaped her to be the beautiful young lady she is today. So now Bree is returning that and she is now mentoring folks in her own special way. And that's what it is. It's the circle of giving. And it not only helps your, the mentee, but it helps you become that person that we are all supposed to be. Rosalind, I'm gonna have you keep going. I, you know, there's just such a theme of excellence and 
the term black excellence is something that is so wonderful to celebrate. And I would just love to know what that means to you personally. So thinking back to all those elders that helped shape me be the person that I am, I always say excellence is in everyone. We just have to really be molded to know for ourselves, because I can tell you, you are excellent all day long, but if you don't know it yourself, it will never become into fruition. So when I think of black excellence, so to speak, I think about all those folks that helped shape me because as a child growing up, sometimes I was the only person of color in my class. So I had to be better and do better. I was just as smart as my peers, but I was often reminded that because of what I looked like and because of my gender, that I had to work harder. So when I think of black excellence, I think about all the folks in the African-American community that may not be acknowledged on TV or on radio and given awards. I'm thinking about folks like Brie and Coy that are doing things on a daily basis to empower people, to uplift people, and to actually be the excellent person that they've always been destined to be. So that is my definition of Black excellence. Thank you so much. Koi, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And thank you, Rosalyn. Um, I think, uh, just like Rosalind said, Black excellence is, you know, not just the celebrities that we see on TV, but it's the, it's the everyday people who um, happen to be African-American and I think who, one, believes in themselves, believes in their community, but not only that, um, uses their resources, be it, be it money, be it your voice, be it your time, to uplift those in your community. Um, and even passing, passing knowledge down. Um, so I don't think it's um, necessarily defined as, um, I don't know, I guess a celebrity with a lot of money. Um, but again, I look, I, I look at Brie, I look at the, the folks that we serve. And when you can lift yourself up out of such a place and be on a webinar speaking to um, people all over the world, that's, that's Black excellence. We have it right in front of us. I couldn't agree more. Bree, do you want to add to that? I, I might have to let them just let that marinate because that was beautiful. Like, that's that's the most honest thing i think just with our peers and our family and things like that i don't believe in a celebrity thing um the black excellence i think it's us showing our good qualities and features just being around you know what i'm saying um our loved ones our, my, my environment, my job, my work family, everybody show me different qualities that they have. And that's considered black excellence to me. And, oh, thank you. And in light of there being a sort of an amplified focus on, on this uplifting and uplifting black communities, um, there are now, new helping hands being offered like never before and an interest in and in greater involvement in, in this uplifting. Um, Koi, Labrida, I'm thinking about empowerment plan. First, have you recently worked with an especially effective partner? Has there been someone in your community, either a, a company, a partner, an individual, if one comes to mind, that has been a great ally um, that has sort of jumped in and, and helped in a way that, that you want to see replicated? Um, I guess I can, <laughs> I can take it. Um, I think most recent, um, I would have to say, um, as far as corporations, um, General Motors, um, 
And it's, it's because we had this idea where our uh, chief development officer had this great idea of taking a road trip and helping people in all different cities, right? And so um, she, conv she convinced General Motors to basically help us do this. And so even now, Veronica is, Veronica is our CEO. She's um, going around the country, handing out coats. Um, she's going to tent cities. She's going in places where folks don't normally visit. Um, and I think that in itself, that shows that we're supporting the community. We're, we're, we're behind your cause. Um, and as an individual, the person that comes to mind is um, one of our um, community partners. Her name is Dr. Stacy. Dr. Stacy um, provided, I think probably now 12 workshops on um, trauma-informed care. And she presents it in such a way that she she cap she captures everyone's attention and she really she believes in her practice and she's helping others understand her practice so for 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 all of our management team she she's made sure that we understand and we're equipped with the knowledge to help even more people um, to make sure that we're doing them a, um, a good service, that we're not just saying, okay, this Band-Aid will cover this up, but here is why we need the Band-Aid in the first place. Yeah, just getting to that, that root cause and, and seeing a need and answering it to it in a way that can be sustainable and have exponential impact. Um, I think that's that's certainly a, a great takeaway. And, and when we're thinking about our own communities and how we can engage when, when we see something that can be solved and not just put a Band-Aid on it, but think about how our skills or connection can help further it. Um, Brie and Koi, I'd love to hear from you too. Oh, excuse me, Brie and, and Rosalind. Brie, do you want to add anything to that about someone that's been particularly helpful or effective in the way that they've, they've been able to help? Yes, I guess we can touch on Dr. Stacy again. I would consider her as um, a life coach-ish um, mentor, like pretty much really a life coach. And she really do a really, really good job at grabbing our attention to make us realize what we we're going through. And some things we have to look at a different angle of trying to tackle it. Um, so many traumas that we have been through that it re we, we really can't forget them. We just have to live with it and go on. And with that life coach, it's, it's, it's a really good start. Thank you. Rosalind? For me, as far as the institution itself, I really can't expand on that. But I can say as far as the partners that we've established through our food pantry, we've had folks, various alumni association members come and give us in-kind donations. We've partnered with Phil Abundance. We've also partnered with the Chester County Food Bank and Salem Baptist Church in Roslyn, Pennsylvania. And these folks actually stepped in when the pandemic hit because we still had students on campus. We had over a hundred students that were actually more comfortable on campus than going home. So these folks actually stepped up and they provided the food the personal products, the laundry detergent, everything we needed to help those students at that time. And going forward, they are still helping us fight food insecurity and period poverty on campus. So those are some of the different organizations that come to mind. And Rosalind, you started, so you 
Wolf's food pantry in 2019. So it yes. predated pandemic needs, um, mm -hmm. but it was a need that you saw at the time. Yes, I did because I noticed over the years that students would come into my office and they were hungry. And at first you don't think anything of it. You just say, oh, they're students, they eat anyway but we would have food, we would have the microwave in there, we would have water. But over the years, I started to notice that the need increased. Folks don't understand that when you're a college student, just because you have a meal plan, doesn't mean you're not food insecure. So some colleagues and I were just talking about what do we do, what can we do? And then you started seeing articles about food insecurity and how it's really affecting college students, particularly students of color. So that's when I said, you know what, enough is enough. I'm tired of seeing students hungry because if you're hungry, you cannot focus on your academics. Research shows that. And I know for a fact, I've had too many students say, Ms. Roz, I can't go to class. I can't take this test. I have to go to work to feed my family, or I have to take this refund so I can feed my family. So in 2019, we started very small to address that. Also with period poverty, folks don't understand when you are financially insecure as a female, that time during the month, folks don't think she may not be able to get these products that she needs. We've had too many female students that would come in my office hysterical because they had no feminine products. So that's why we were motivated to start the pantry because I said from that day forward, I did not want to see another female come in my office hysterical in tears because they can't go to class. They can't leave their room. Or a student says, I haven't eaten in two days. I'm a commuter student. I don't have a meal plan. I can't get into the cafeteria. So that's why we started. And we expanded it with the laundry detergent, with the personal products, because we said, if you can't buy food, we know that folks have a need for those personal items. And we also are located in a food desert. The closest supermarket is probably five miles away. It may be a little less, but when you're in the heart of a food desert and the only transportation you have is public transportation that doesn't go by that store, then we needed to do something. And that's what we did. So now our students can come into the pantry at any time they need and get these personal products, get the laundry detergent, get the toilet paper, paper towels or whatever they need. Because again, our students come from marginalized communities and a lot of their parents don't have the means to get these things. And now with COVID, we really know that folks don't have it. Everyone is struggling, everyone. And Koi mentioned, you know, there are young ladies who have degrees who are facing homelessness. We have families who both parents were working and now they're both trying to get unemployment or they're waiting for unemployment. So we have those things and we also find resources as far as if they need food stamps, if they need medical insurance, things of that nature, if they need medical attention because they don't have insurance, we partnered with um, community volunteers in medicine. Our students, because they're residents of Chester County can go to this place and they can get the mental wellness, they can get the OBGYN care and they can get the medical um, assistance that they may need as well as medicine. So we try to give, I guess, a holistic approach in terms of the pantry as well, because again, if you're hungry, you're not going to succeed academically. And again, with this holistic approach, Rosalind, it, it's just, it's so wonderful that, you know, you, you and your team members recognize this need and it can start so small. I mean, I feel like folks genuinely want to be able to help. And we hear those inquiries a lot, you know, people want to get involved, don't know where to start. And I think this is just such a wonderful example of it, it can be fairly simple, just recognizing a need and a need in another person and thinking, 
you don't need to be a, a business or a corporation or a nonprofit to pitch in and help, you know, any individual can make it a thing with their family or with their friends or even individually to think about how to problem solve in these ways in their community. And I'm not sure if she's on with us now, but Lori from Brookline wrote in when she registered to say that um, her son and his friends had co-founded Brookline Cares, which is a student-run organization that's raising money to be able to purchase empowerment coats to be distributed um, to folks in need in the Boston area, which is so wonderful. And I, I just love that connection of, you know, seeing this opportunity to help and making a connection to an amazing organization and seeing that sort of radial effect um, I think uh, we only have five minutes left. It thus, of course, went by so quickly. Um, but I think perhaps a good question to end on, and Gregory from Ohio wrote this in, is where or how would be the best place to help in local communities? I know we're talking about it, you know, as we speak, but if more things come to mind that y'all want to weigh in on, um, how, how, can, how can people pitch in? What, how should they be approaching you know, this thinking around help and support in their community? Um, cool. Yeah, Corey, do you wanna start? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just reading the question. Um, our uh, CDO said Veronica just met with uh, the folks you mentioned in Boston on the road trip. Wow. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Erica. But as far, how, as far as how to get involved with your local community, um, I would say, what's your passion? What, what do you want to help with? Um, if it's homelessness, contact the homeless shelters in your area. Um, if it's, um, I don't know, mentoring children, maybe contact the local Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, or um, the elementary schools in your area. So I think at first, um, consider what you want to help with, and then go from there. Excellent. Bree, do you want to add anything? Whatever you want to do, never give up. Keep trying. Always be determined and motivated, and things shall work out. Excellent advice. Um, Rosalind, you gave us a lot of amazing info about how you were able to create something that really gave back to the community. Do you have any other thoughts that you want to share with our audience about how just how to help out in the best way? I just want to say I concur with Corey because reach out. I always say when you want to help, you have the five things, who, what, where, why, and how. That, that's what you want to ask yourself. So Koi really hit it right on the nose because you wanna say, who do I wanna help? How do I wanna help? Where do I wanna help and why? And that will actually help those in the audience say, okay, this is how I can help locally. I am gonna reach out. I wanna help the homeless population. So I am gonna reach out to the different homeless organizations and say, how can I help? What can I do? And that's how you start it. And then you can determine, okay, where else do I want to go to navigate how else I can help? And it will actually come to you once you start helping one organization with that passion, you'll see, you know what? Okay, I can do this, or I can expand on this, or you know what? Koi, Bree, y'all have coats, but what about hats? What about socks? What about this? Let's put this together and then you'll see that you have a whole team of folks and you're giving to different organizations to just continue that cycle of giving to help those in the community and just so it can return tenfold. Yeah. So that would be my answer. I love the who, what, where, why, and how. I mean, that's the hardest part is getting started and you know, what you've proved is just when you start an empowerment plan, and I feel like I could say the same thing. Once you start, people really want to jump in and they recognize how their skill can be a benefit. And it's such a beautiful thing. I think, you know, that's really what drives this community support together. So it just takes one person to, to get started. And this is some excellent advice. I'd see just one more question. 
or a statement um, from, from Gay. Very impressive women. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for all you do and for sharing today. And I want to note that Shanika also put in the chat, uh, Librita is an awesome testimony to the power of a mentor. Thank you for sharing your story. And I think that thank you truly goes to all three of you. Thank you so very much for being here tonight and sharing your experiences and expertise and incredibly powerful advice with all of us. We're, we're so grateful for your time. Thanks for all that you're doing and, and doing to help your community. Truly inspiring. Thank you to our audience for joining us tonight too. This has really become um, a wonderful, I mean, it's only the third one, but each month, you know, we're, we're getting on a roll and it, it's so wonderful to come together to have these conversations. So thank you for being a part of it. And we look forward to the next one. Um, I hope everyone has a really good night. Thank you, ladies. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Nice Thank to meet you. you.